This morning we're going to continue in the book of Maasei Hashlichim, the book of Acts, chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. Here we are at the High Holy Days, and at the t point of, the, of Rosh Hashanah every year, it has become a tradition to publish the number of people in Israel and worldwide. The number of Jewish people. And it's very interesting for those such as myself. I was born 15 years after the Shoah ended and 12 years after Israel was founded. It's very interesting to have lived through many years where this number has hardly changed or only grown by the smallest amount. But this year, we see that Israel's population as of Rosh Hashanah, which begins tomorrow night, stands at 9,092,000 and is expected to reach 10 million by the year 2024. There are 6.744 million Jews in Israel today, which is 74% of the total population and 1.9 million Arabs. And since last year alone, the population has risen by 184,000. Israelis gave birth to 196,000 children in the past year. Some people died, some people moved to Israel, and so that's how we come up with 184,000 in growth. And so they are saying that at the current pace, Israel will have 15 million residents by its 100th birthday in 2048. Worldwide, there are now 14.8 million Jews, a slight increase from 14.7 last year. That is a number that's incredibly significant because the enemy sought to eradicate us from the faith's face of the earth and one out of three Jews worldwide and the vast majority of Jews in Europe were annihilated during the Shoah. Once again, the Jewish people are growing as a vibrant nation worldwide. And interestingly, as Canadians, we should note that following Israel and the U.S., which are the world's largest Jewish populations, the next largest Jewish population is the, in the world is the Jews of France at 450,000. And as you know, some of those are now beginning to move to Israel because of the anti-Semitism and attacks in that country and the Jews in Canada at 392,000. In other words, what I'm suggesting is Canada's on track to become the world's third largest Jewish community. It's very significant and something worthy of our prayers as we seek to make Messiah known among our Jewish people in this country. Canada is a significant place. The enemy sought to destroy us. But here we are, Am Yisrael Chai, as we say. And many people have noticed, theologians and historians, have noticed that the Jewish people have suffered, in a sense, and, and suffered tremendously, and yet have, almost out of the jaws of defeat, have been resurrected in the state of Israel. It's not as if God gave Israel a consolation prize, but somehow God has worked through tragedy to bring good. Out of evil, good has come. And we're going to see in Acts chapter 12 how evil was perpetrated upon the believers in Messiah. And as that evil was perpetrated upon them, God snatched evil, or snatched victory, out of defeat. The Jewish people suffered. In a sense, we've experienced new life. 
a partial fulfill, fulfillment of the valley of the dry bones prophesied by the prophet Ezekiel where the bones have come back together. A nation is alive. I just spent the last week in Israel and while there it was obvious the nation is alive. We celebrated a wedding in the Judean hills around Jerusalem. We just sang about the mountains around Jerusalem. And when you're in those hills and the mountains, nothing like our Rockies, but nevertheless, mountains around Jerusalem, you can see exactly what the psalmist was talking about. The mountains protect the mountain of Jerusalem, which is the height of them all. And here we are. Am Yisrael Chai. We've suffered. And in a sense, people draw a parallel to the to our Messiah himself, who, sinless, very unlike us as Israel, but sinless, suffered and died, and God brought victory out of his death. It's a pattern that occurs throughout history, and in fact, we can expect it to happen in our own generation, sometimes in our own lives. That even when tragedy strikes, when evil happens, God works in amazing ways. Another example of this is my aunt in Israel. Now she is going blind. She's quite elderly. But her husband, my uncle, my father's brother, died a number of years ago tragically in hospital due to an infection. As we know, that happens in hospitals. And it was a real blow for the family. And she misses him every day, she says. But she also rejoices that as a result, God gave her a ministry among Arabs who otherwise would never hear the gospel, that even a former terrorist has come to know Messiah, Yeshua, and that she has been able to enter Arab villages, which is illegal um, um, in the Palestinian Authority, illegal for a Jew to go to, an Israeli Jew. She has been able to enter those and be a witness that we can love one another, that there are Jews who love Arabs, and as a result, Arab hearts have been opened to Messiah, Yeshua. Their hearts have been changed. God snaps victory out of the jaws of defeat. This is what happens in Acts chapter 12. Much has happened. It is now since Yeshua's resurrection, another eight years, Stephen has been martyred years and years ago. But now we read in Acts 12 and verse 1, around this time, um, after the events of chapter 11 where, where Bar Nabas and Shaul have gone with a collection of relief, financial relief for the believers in Israel, Herod, the king, stretched out his hand to harass some from the church, the Kehilah. Then he killed Yaakov, the brother of Yohanan, with the sword. Remember, among Yeshua's Talmudim, his disciples, there were three who were in the inner circle. Peter, James, and John. Yaakov and Yohanan. And this Yaakov, the brother of Yohanan, one of these top three, is killed by the sword. Who is this evil man Herod who would do this? Because until now, the believers have suffered mainly religious persecution. But now this is the governing authority that is taking the initiative and beginning to attack them. And as we look at history, we see that this is none other than the grandson of Herod the Great, the very one who went out of his way to seek to kill the newly born king of the Jews in the town of Bethlehem, an evil man. This is the cousin of Herod Agrippa, who went out of his way to arrest Yohanan Hamatbil, John the Baptist, and beheaded him also 
a wicked man. His wife couldn't stand the fact that, that he was being called on their incestuous relationship upon their evil. This is a man from an evil family. They're political opportunists. They want to hold on to power. And one way in the Roman Empire that you hold on to power is you keep the people happy. You are able to collect large sums of taxes which go to Rome. You increase your prestige in the eyes of Rome. And you secure your position. And so Herod is this man who doesn't care about right or wrong. But he sees, a, that, he sees that if he attacks the believers, that it will go well for him in the eyes of Rome, his employers, essentially. And so he killed Yaakov, the brother of Yohanan, with the sword. It's a tragedy that comes upon the early believers. And it seems that this went so well for him. He got so much respect from those who were opposed to the believers that he proceeded in verse 3 to fur further to seize Kepha also. And this was during the days of unleavened bread. So we know exactly what time of years it w year it was. It was during Pesach, the Feast of Unleavened Bread that follows it. And so it was the anniversary, the eighth anniversary, if we add up the years, after Yeshua had died and risen from the dead. And here is Kepha, Peter, and he is arrested. And it's quite obvious what's going to happen to him. You can't kill people during the festival. That's just not the right kind of thing to do. It's not going to please anyone. Um, it's not a nice thing to do. And it's not a nice thing to have happen. So he puts Kepha in jail. And when he arrested him, he delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him intending to bring him before the people after Passover. And so here are four squads of soldiers that are watching Kepha. Obviously, they're taking shifts so that there is always a squad or two who are keeping their eyes open in case someone, these violent, supposedly violent and militaristic believers who might come and seek to deliver the leader of their movement, Kepha. And so there is violence. There is something happening that is, seek that is new among the believers. They are in a position where now they are no longer just facing religious persecution, and the religious persecution, for example, is what believers in Israel have from time to time experienced in the modern state of Israel. Not often, but my cousins have experienced it and various individuals have experienced it. Um, religious persecution, usually from the ultra-Orthodox. But now it's moved to something that you don't see in Israel, but you do see in other parts of the world where the opposition is also governmental. They're in dire straits. Their leader, Kepha, is in jail. And the people are struggling. What is their response as they deal with this problem? I think it's a response that's instructive to us. Because now we read in verse 5, Kepha was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the kahila, by the congregation, by the believers, the body of Messiah. Constantly now, fervently, they began to pray. Sometimes we look askance at those who have never prayed to God, but who end up in dire straits, and then all of a sudden become those who pray. The old saying is, in foxholes, like in, in the middle of an artillery, artillery bombardment, when soldiers are hiding in holes in the ground to try and save their lives, in foxholes there are no atheists. 
And in reality, that might be a bit of a problem if people are offering up insincere prayers from those foxholes. In fact, some people have actually realized they need to get their lives right with God as well. But here are believers. They are those who are already following God. And now they know whom to turn to. They have the Psalms. And they realize as they read the Psalms, which is their scriptures, they don't have any Brit Hadashah. No New Testament has been written in their day. They turn to their scriptures and like King David, they turn to the Lord in the depths of their struggles and in the, in the midst of the problems that they are facing. And so their constant prayer is being offered up to the Lord. And the words offered up are very significant because they imply that these prayers are like sacrifice, that they are like the smoke that arises from a sacrifice that is made before the Lord. And indeed, the scriptures talk about our prayers as a sacrifice, and that's actually one of the themes of Yom Kippur, our prayers offered up before the Almighty God. And so there they are, almost as priests offering up sacrifices, coming before God fervently. And we don't know exactly now why their prayer is answered in exactly the way it is. But God is going to do something great. It didn't happen with Yaakov earlier in verse 2. He was killed. But Kepha is going to be delivered. We don't know the wisdom of God. We don't know why God deals with one person differently than another. And the scripture here doesn't even attempt to understand or to say why. Simply, it is our job and our duty to pray to him, to seek his face. Because Kepha is in difficult time. In difficult times. We read in verse 6, when Herod was about to bring him out, so it must have been the last day of the feast. That night, Kepha was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. There's no human way in which anyone could think Kepha has anything ahead of him other than death. He is chained not, by, not to one soldier, as is normal, but he's chained to two. He has four squads of guards around him, and Agrippa, Herod, uh, Herod rather, clearly does not want any repeat of the resurrection of Yeshua from the dead. He is going to make sure that Kepha dies. You don't invest that much effort without being sure what you want to do with the person you have as a prisoner. But Herod is not counting on God. And so the believers, however, are. We have a strong tower to whom we can go. God could have let Kepha pass on and he, his word would have continued. But God here is going to do something that is going to show his power and show how he does things. Because God brings glory to himself. And so after we read about the persecution of the believers in verses 1 to 6, in verses 7 to verse 17, we see that God acts. And we read some of this just a few minutes ago. We read in verse 7, An angel of the Lord stood by Kepha. There he is in his chains. It's probably hard to sleep with two guards who probably aren't that friendly and don't want to become emotionally attached to a prisoner who's going to die. So they're not treating him too well. They're uh, just ignoring him and treating him as a condemned man whom they don't want to know. Why would they want to know someone and feel sympathy for someone who is condemned to death? So Kepha is not exactly in a happy situation. 
but an angel, a malach, an emissary of the Lord. Angels are those whom God sends. They are messengers. And here the angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he strikes Peter on the side, and so Kepha is lying there, strikes him and wakes him up, and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. What an amazing thing to happen. There's no hint here that Kepha is suffering um, unhappily, that he's wallowing in his circumstances, and that he's given up. Nothing particularly is said, but we can assume, based on how Shaul dealt with the situation when he became a prisoner, that Kepha too was willing and happy to suffer for the Messiah. Didn't mean that he's not suffering. He's actually suffering. It's not pleasant, and he's aware of it. But he's willing to go through that for the sake of Messiah. And now he is woken up. And what he hadn't dreamed was possible is now become reality. And the chains have fallen off his hands. His wrists are probably chaffed and maybe even bleeding. But now he is a free man. And as the angel does that. He says, arise quickly. And the angel says to him, gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. Kepha is probably sleeping on his garment. And now he is being told to put it on. And so he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel, the Malach, is real. Of course, it's the middle of the night. He thinks he's dreaming. This is what he wished could happen. And now it's happening. He is walking out the doors of that prison. God is essentially evicting him from that prison. He's being delivered and he's not even sure that it's real. And, they, and, and so the doors opened up of their own accord. The iron gate that leads to the city opens up. They went out, went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. Now Kepha is a free man. Now he's in the city, and he's no longer in the jail. And so when he came to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. In the book of Acts, typically whenever the Jewish people are mentioned or the Jews are mentioned, it's typically in a context where the Jews are a minority in a place say, such as Antioch. Here, they're in Jerusalem. Kepha is a Jew. All the other Talmudim, the disciples, are Jews. Almost all of the believers there are Jews. And everyone pretty much in the city, apart from some Roman soldiers and Greeks, would be Jewish. They're in a Jewish world. And so who are these Jews? These are the Jews who are persecuting the early believers. And Kepha knows that the Lord is on his side and has delivered him from the hand of Herod. What a remarkable thing to happen. It's not an anti-Jewish statement, but he knows that those who are his greatest enemies, which are this religious elite, a religious elite that does not want things disturbed so that they might have better control over the population, this religious elite is being put in its place by God. And so God delivers him. We read in the coming verses, when he considered this, he came to the house of Miriam, the mother of Yohanan, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. They're there praying. They're praying for the deliverance, no doubt, of 
of Kepha. And Kepha, as Kepha knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. And when she recognized Kepha's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Kepha stood before the gate. This is someone who is so fervently seeking the Lord and so much wanting Kepha to be free that when she hears his voice, she is overwhelmed with her excitement. She's overcome and she runs to tell everyone and she forgets that she needs to let Kepha in. He's outside, he's continuing to knock on the door because he wants to get out of the street where a passing Roman might see him. He wants to get in a house where there's relative safety. And Rhoda, however, is rejoicing. And here is a lesson, too, that sometimes when God acts, we cannot believe what he has done. We cannot believe the blessing that he is pouring out upon us. Here is uh, the girl, and everyone's telling her, we can't believe you. You know, you're, you're just uh, you're, you're imagining things. And she keeps insisting. And they say, no, it must be his angel. He must have an angel who is there instead of him. But we read in verse 16, Kepha continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. This is how God works. The book of Yaakov says, the fervent prayer of a righteous person is, in the King James, availeth much. It's very effective. Fervent prayer from those who are walking with the Lord avails much. It's still up to God to choose to do what is in his plan. But nevertheless, prayer has power with God. And they are astonished. So motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought them out of the prison. And he said, Go tell these things to Yaakov and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. Who is this Yaakov? We just read in verse 2 about Yaakov who had been crucified or rather been killed by Herod. This Yaakov is the brother of Yeshua himself. This is the Yaakov who will almost in a sense take the leadership of the congregation in Rome over from Kepha himself and who will lead that congregation until he himself is killed by people in Jerusalem, an event that's even been memorialized and written up in secular and Jewish sources of the time. He was known as a righteous man. And so Yaakov, Yeshua's half-brother, and the brethren are to be told. And then we read lastly, he went and departed to another place. And here Luke is kind of mysterious. He doesn't say where this other place is. He doesn't say if Kepha went with someone else. Doesn't say if it's in the city or out of the city. So he kind of keeps the mystery that probably everyone had at that time. Kepha wasn't going to tell anyone where he is going because he needs to hide from the authorities. And so he departed and went to another place. God had worked. God had delivered. God had answered prayer. And here we see that picture happening just as it has happened to Israel because Israel today, as a nation that lives, lives in part because of the prayers of many Jewish people over the centuries who've prayed for the restoration of Zion, but also many Christians who realized that the scriptures prophesy the restoration of the people of Israel. The scriptures prophesy their partial return before Messiah comes and gathers the rest, rest from the four corners of the earth. And they were praying and trusting that according to his word, God's 
will would be done and Israel would be restored. And today, Israel is a thriving, democratic, free state. The number of uh, cranes that you see in Tel Aviv is phenomenal. The view from my cousin's apartment on the 24th floor of a high-rise right next to the safari in Israel is not only of the safari, but across Tel Aviv, a skyline very much like Vancouver's with many tall buildings. Years ago, there was only one tower in all of Tel Aviv called Migdal Shalom, and now they cannot be counted. God has worked mightily. God has done the unexpected. The enemy has done his worst, but God has brought about his purposes. Sometimes we don't know all of God's purposes in our lives in terms of uh, what he plans to do with us in terms of our careers or, or maybe financially or in terms of our role in the body of Messiah. We don't know what the next step is very often. We know what God's will is for us as believers to bear the fruit of the Ruach HaKodesh, to grow closer into conformity with the image of his Son, those things are very clear. We can pray fervently like these believers did. And even though we may be pers persecuted, even though tragedies might come upon us, we can trust that God's will will be done in those areas where he has already declared his purpose because we know what God's purpose is in, the, in that regard. He's declared it to us. He wants us to grow in him and bring glory to him. That's what happens to us. What happens to Herod? This is the crowning end of the story. Because in verses 18 to 22, we see the story that the soldiers are running around trying to find out where Kepha is. There's desperation. There's panic as they create a huge commotion looking for Kepha. They can't find him in the jail. The soldiers who were tied to him cannot believe that he's no longer uh, chained to them. And they're probably scared. Where could he be? And what has happened? And we read in verse 19, when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. So he is giving up on his project. He is no longer persecuting the believers. He goes down from Jerusalem to Caesarea, which is on the northern coast of Israel, and goes back to safety because that's a very Roman city. We were there on our tour of Israel in March. And there he is in that Roman city, back home in safety. But he has failed. But Kepha is free. We read in verse 20 that events go on. Here is Herod now. He's back on the coast. And the people of Tyre and Sidon, further north up the coast, have been experiencing his wrath. And this is very interesting because in the scripture, that area east of Tyre and Sidon is actually given to Israel. And my aunt mentioned, uh, she's full of stories, so I get to relate a couple of them to you. She, she mentioned many of the Lebanese soldiers, the Christian Lebanese, after the war in 1982 when Israel invaded Lebanon, after Lebanon was given back to the Lebanese, they were granted asylum in Israel because they would have been persecuted, possibly killed, by other Lebanese and Hezbollah in Lebanon. So they live, these Christian Lebanese, in northern Israel. And she asked him, is there any chance that you might ever want to move back to your hometown? And his answer was, one day, when Messiah rules in Jerusalem, 
And that land is therefore under Messiah's rulership. Then I will be happy to move back to my town because it will be under Israeli rule and I will be safe. That was his answer. Well, here is Herod. He's very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They're just a number of miles and kilometers north of Caesarea, a day's journey. And these people want to make peace with him. He's a powerful figure. And so they asked for peace, and they wanted to make sure that everything was going to be good between them all. And here is where Herod now, he's basically pulled off a bit of a coup. Because now that they have come to him, basically swearing allegiance, he now has more power than ever. He's increasing his power as he makes peace with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They couldn't withstand his wrath. And so he decides to give a speech. On verse 21, on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave his oration to them. The day of success. He has experienced defeat in Judea. Defeat in Jerusalem. Because the Lord has delivered Kepha from his hand. But now this is a success that he can revel in. And now he can feel really good about himself. And how his power is increasing. And how he's becoming more and more important. And the people began to shout out, verse 22, the voice of a God and not of a man. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God and he was eaten by worms and died. In other words, a very shameful, humiliating, painful death as his body is eaten by worms. Evil eventually gets what is coming to it. God always brings ultimately his righteousness to bear. The Psalms make it clear that sometimes the evil may even go to their graves in what appears to be prosperity and wealth. But nevertheless, God works sometimes so that we can see his hand. And on this day, I think you can almost picture Herod standing before the people in his royal garments, beginning to not feel well, and then suddenly getting an attack of pain and leaving the podium and disappearing because now he is mortally ill and within a short time he dies. He's eaten by worms and dies. God brings about his righteous purposes and he brings glory to himself. That's something we can rejoice in. In conclusion, we read, the word of God grew and multiplied. We've seen that many times in the book of Acts. There is persecution. There is trouble. There is a move of the Spirit. Whatever it is, again and again, Luke points out that whatever has happened among the early believers in Jerusalem, it all works out so that the Word of God goes forth, so that the believers grow in number, so that there are those added to their number day by day. We have a God we can trust in, we have a God that we can see in this chapter, in the history of Israel, and even sometimes in our own lives, snatches victory from the jaws of defeat. And we realize that with God, those jaws of defeat have no teeth. Absolutely none. Because our God is the victor every time. And in the Olam Haba, in the world to come, even if we haven't seen it fully in this life, we will be able to rejoice in his presence and we will be able to see his victory. And as the scriptures say, he will wipe away every tear from our eyes 
because he will bring about what is good and what is right. What a wonderful blessing we will have in that day.